To start off with, we have to pour one out for our homie Frank. Mr. Frets.com, Frank Ford, who passed away a few days ago. I discovered his website in 1998. I think that might have been the year he started it, and that's probably around the time that this photo was taken. This is what high-definition online photos look like back in the 90s, kids. They would take like 30 seconds to load. Frank was not only a pioneer in repair techniques, but also the progenitor of the idea that guitar repair information could be shared on the internet. Prior to that, it was a very secretive business. He was the first. In 25 years, I had two short email exchanges with Frank, in which we were both very professional and didn't yammer on, you know. But Frank Ford was a very important influence for me, uh, but also virtually all guitar repair people working today, even the ones who don't know it. Got a really nice old Martin in the shop today. This is an 015. I've always had an appreciation for the all mahogany models. This guy here is from 1958. They have a really warm sound. Uh, very even string response all the way across. I remember Kenneth Pattengale talking about why he fell into playing these, and he says that when you're doing single note runs, you almost can't tell which string is being played because there's very little timbral difference between the wound strings and the unwound. Somehow it, it makes a very even, very cohesive sound. I think his is 1954. Uh, this being a small-bodied instrument, you get this kind of intimate sound, sort of harkens back to some time when music was something you shared with close friends and relations. It's a very human-sized sound. Who else played one of these? John Frusciante of the Red Hot Chili Peppers has got a few that he uses a lot. Uh, back in the day, mostly a number of folky-type songsters. I think Woody Guthrie might have had one, although it could have been a 17. I don't remember. The O15 was introduced in 1940, and it was the most inexpensive guitar in Martin's lineup at that point. You know, it was as simple as they could make it and sort of maintain the Martin aesthetic principles. Uh, it's also the smallest body guitar, Pro well, for decades after that. It was probably the late 90s before they came out with something smaller than this. Like I say, all mahogany, top sides and back. Rosewood fingerboard and bridge. They happen to be Brazilian, of course, in this era. And um, no binding, which is kind of atypical for Martin guitars. The finish on these is not a high gloss finish either. They didn't buff it up to a super high shine. And there's other evidence of sort of speed of production. On the back here there are some striations from what's probably a stroke sander. They look like 80 grit. The stroke sander is what's well, a big floppy belt sander, something like 25 feet long and um, the belt is spinning and the guitar is held on a platen that you can push in and out away and towards the operator and you get a paddle kind of thing that you get to press down onto the spinning belt while moving this in and out and it sands the, uh, the instrument relatively flat. In this case it got a little bit away from them. You know I did have a discussion with the owner about whether this finish had been stripped at some point maybe refinished partially or something just looking at the back here, how level some of the previous crack repairs are. Uh, they're like unnaturally level. And just the redness of the color. I don't know, it looks more like regular mahogany to me than like the mahogany finish color that Martin used. In my memory they're always a little more brown than this. And this finish seems a little out of character, just in general. You know, there are areas on the sides that have a lot of dings and, you know, wear, but like, Where's the buckle rash? It's too clean. So I, I don't know. So this thing is in pretty good shape, but there are some previous repairs and some cracks that we want to check out and make sure are okay to go. And just give it the once over. So let's get into it. The first thing I want to check out is the bridge here, which appears to be full height. It's never been cut down, which is nice to see. And the saddle here is low, which is kind of what you expect in a guitar of this vintage. Usually they've been brought down to uh, make for better playing action. They didn't start off super high either. These through saddles, um, they were a little bit on the lower side than what they ended up being in later years. The top on this guitar has some distortion and waviness in it. Now there's a bit of a hump behind the bridge, which is very common. And interestingly, 
there's a hump in front of it, too. Um, sort of around the, the pit guard area here, kind of goes up and down. I suspect this happened when the guard contracted over the years. It may have pulled the top up with it. You know, there is a repaired pit guard crack in here, which I'm not too worried about. Like all of these things have that. Uh, it's very common. You know, it's usually the other way around. You know, a big dip into the sound hole, which is something to worry about. But in this case, this one might actually work in our favor to sort of counteract some of the folding action. Ironic as that might sound. The thing about mahogany tops is they tend to be very thin. You know, they need to be to get some response out of them. You know, it is a hardwood after all, rather than spruce. And that can lead to some interesting contradictions, you know, because it needs to be thin to be flexible enough, but when it's that thin, it also tends to distort more. Um, I'll look inside to make sure all the braces are intact, but I think we're doing okay with this top. The owner wanted to know about the state of the frets. These are actually in pretty good shape. There's some fairly extensive play wear in the lower positions here. The board has got some grooves that have been plowed into it, but the frets themselves seem to be in good shape. They may have been dressed down at some point. In terms of the fret height, we're looking at just over 30 thousandths, which is pretty good for these guys. Uh, they would have started off somewhere around 40 thousandths, so there's plenty of material left on there, and they're not in bad shape. Some of the tuner buttons have seen better days. The shaft on this one is bent as well. The owner actually wants to replace the tuners, and I'll give these back to him um, so he can save them or do whatever he wants. There is an open crack in the back, which does need addressing. It runs for about three inches. It's actually pretty tight and fairly level, so that's good. There's another crack that runs along the side here towards the end block on the treble side. Also fairly tight. Another thing of concern, it's happening again. Here's another case where the string end wrappings are coming up over top of the saddle. So we'll have to look and see what the bridge pad is like. The string action looks really good actually. It is less than 6 64ths on the base side. And five even on the treble. So, no problem there. This thing, um, I mean, we could do a neck reset if someone wanted to spend a whole bunch of money, but no, it's not really necessary. This, after 65 years, is just fine. And the neck relief, seven thousandths. Beautiful. This has some unslotted bridge pins in it. And they fit more or less okay. One or two of them could use just a little bit of reaming. Well, looks like I spoke too soon. With the strings off, I can see grooves have been cut into what's left of the saddle, and the base strings are basically down on the wood surface. So, neck reset time it is. Inside, the braces are all intact and glued. On this economy model, the boys in the glue room were a little more fast and loose with the squeeze out. They didn't really care about cleaning it up as much as they usually did. The bridge pad is okay, but the holes for the low E and A strings are large enough that the ball ends pull up right through them and sit against the underside of the bridge, which is no good. There's also some mysterious glue staining around them. Maybe someone took an extra turn of the reamer when they were fitting the replacement pins and had to thicken the hole back out a bit. There's evidence of crack repair, of course. There's a little tiny strip of broken curved lining uh, down in the bottom where the edge took a hit. And one of the finger braces may have been re-glued, or that staining simply could have oozed through when the pick guard crack was glued up. Just looking through the sound hole, I can see where a back brace obviously came loose at some point and was re-glued. Some stains on the wood. Let's start on the side crack here. It's a good place to start. Uh, important to get these looked after. You know, you start off with a little crack in the side, you're one good bump away from having it split all the way around your guitar, which is a much more annoying and expensive repair. Using the suction cup to 
force the glue through the joint, being quite liberal with the glue. I'm using fish glue, uh, could just as easily be tight bond, sometimes it is. I'm not that kind of glue snob, you know. There are people who, you know, if someone else is doing a repair on YouTube and they see that they're not using hide glue or something, they're jumping in my inbox demanding that I police them for using the wrong adhesive. And it's like, take it easy. Fish glue has a nice long open time versus hide glue, for instance. It can be difficult to get clamps on and things lined up before the hide glue gels. So that's why I like the fish glue for this kind of thing. Um, I'm using the spool clamps. It's a variation on a violin maker's clamp. They're just a threaded rod with a couple of wing nuts through some segments of dowel with the padded cork faces. Clean up as I go. You can see there's a little bit of squeeze out happening. Actually I can see there's just a wee bit of discrepancy in the height towards the end here. So I'm going to put this clamp on snugly but I'm going to leave a bit of a space between it and the side. I usually do because I don't want the threaded rod rubbing up against the lacquer. But in this case uh, I'll get a, get a little wedge. And use that to level out the crack. I heard it go back into place. So that's much better. And again, do a little bit of cleanup in between the, the clamps. Any remaining squeeze out I'll get afterwards. So I'll let that sit for uh, at least eight hours. I won't really stress the joint until tomorrow. This crack in the back is very similar. The glue goes on, it gets squished in there. I'm using a magnet to align the two sides and also a little clamp here where it's on the tail block and I'll add a little side pressure. For the reset I'll start off by taking out the 15th fret, score along the edges, heat it up, pull it out, and warm up the fingerboard extension and separate that from the top. Okay, foam cutters are going in. I get these from Hot Wire Foam Factory, not a sponsor. These happen to be the product number 035, which is a 4 inch hot knife. The actual length of the thing is closer to 6 inches, but there's 4 inches of usable length. And I power these using the 046, the crafter's power supply. I heated the joint up for about 12 minutes, gave it some wiggles, and it came right out. Quite often the joint between the soundboard and the neck block becomes loose during removal. Very important to stick that back down. Okay, this is some very definite evidence that the guitar was stripped at some point. You can see they did a very clean job of removing the lacquer right up to the edge of the heel. But this stuff under here, this is what it would originally have been like. To repair the wallowed out holes in the bridge plate, I'm going to use my uh, El Cheapo plugging tool here made out of an old countersink bit, which I reground. And the bridge plates on these guys in the late 50s were still quite thin, so the plug is only going to be about a sixteenth of an inch thick. In what is a total upending of the natural order of things, I use the drill in reverse and I pull upwards to cut out a little circular recess into the bridge plate, into which I fit these little maple plugs, which are glued and clamped. Just a little light sanding to make them flush with the surface, and they end up as cute little patches. So if you were going to switch out the tuners on a vintage Martin, these would be the way to go. Some beautiful Waverly's. Widely regarded by many as the nicest tuners ever made. And if you're really fastidious, you make sure all of the slots in the screw heads lie in the same direction. Neck resetting. 
I showed all of this just last week, so I won't belabor it too much. The usual sandpaper pulling. Here you can see the little web of remaining material in the center of the heel, which needs to be removed, or the heel won't sit flush with the sides. You know, that little bit there, it's important to get rid of it. When I'm happy with the neck angle, I get to glue everything back together again. Vintage Martin and Gibson through saddles are glued in place. To remove them, I apply a little cold water to the glue lines and let that sit for about 15 minutes to rehydrate. Then I apply some heat from my silicone heater and it just pops free. Then I'll size a new taller blank. Oh, this was a dirty board. I actually took out a razor blade and scraped most of this off. I reinstalled the 15th fret and did some dressing around the extension area and recrowned. I polished and polished and polished. I redrilled the holes through the patches, backing up the work on the inside with a block of wood. I also had to re-establish accurately sized notches for the strings. I shaped the new saddle and glued it in place. Okay, strings on. To be honest, I'm not happy in this moment because I had set the height to where I wanted it. Um, but while I was filing the saddle to correct the intonation, I managed to reduce the height further on the high E string. This bridge leans forward quite a way, and so does the saddle, and pushing the contact point forward one thirty-second of an inch was enough to lower it more than I wanted. It's approximately ten thousandths of an inch too low. So I'm going to have to make a new saddle. That's the joy of through saddles. They take forever to construct, and then when something goes wrong, you have to go back through the whole process again. There's no shimming something like this. However, it's Christmas Eve Eve, and I'm going to wait a few days before I do that. But anyway, it's fine to play. It's just not exactly the way it should be, so these things happen, um, and I will eventually make a new one, and it'll be just fine.